Hello, Laura back, and this time with an L6M2 Learning Objective 2 essay question. So let's drill in and have a look at this now. Here's our question. Appraise the competitive environment of an organisation of your choice or of one of its strategic business units using Porter's Five Forces framework. So it's clearly told you what you need to do. You need to appraise. So you need to look at the competitive environment of an organization of your choice or one of its business units, strategic business units, and apply the five forces model. So you need to know this model, obviously. So let's drill into this question now. Okay, so what can we define? Well, you could define competition, you could define what Porter's Five Forces is, or you could go off the strategic side of it and define strategy. So I've took the easy way out and done strategy here. So strategy is defined as the direction and scope of an organization over the long term, and that's a definition from Johnson and Scopes. So once we've made a kind of definition, we kind of have to look at the model that it's expecting us to use. And here is the model. Porter's Five Forces is a micro industry analysis tool, which essentially means that it looks at the industry and market and the competitive forces within it, as opposed to say Steeple, which is a macro environmental analysis. So the big picture, the big global area. And these are the five forces, threat of new entrants, threat of substitutes, supplier and buyer power, and competitive rivalry there in the middle. So what we need to do is to take each one of these forces and have it as a separate paragraph in our essay and link it back to an organisation of our choice and make some sort of assessment. I think a conclusion here, in ideally in every paragraph and especially at the end, is important to get those extra marks. So the organisation of my choice is going to be McDonald's. So you have to apply it to an organizational example because it specifically mentions it in the question. That means there will be marks allocated to that example. And if you don't do it, then you're missing out on easy marks. So we're gonna apply everything back to Mackie D's. Okay, where I see students go wrong on a question like this is that they rush straight into the answer. They forget to explain what it means by new entrants and threat of substitutes and so on. So when we're talking about threat of new entrants, we mean how accessible the particular market is to new companies who are coming in. And that is all dependent on what's known as barriers to entry. If there are strong or great barriers to entry, then it may be difficult for new people to enter the market. So examples of barriers include economies of scale, so buying bulk at a cheaper price, brand reputation and loyalty, and the capabilities and resources of an organization. All of this, that makes it quite difficult. Now, some markets are easier to enter than others because there is a lack of these barriers to entry. It's important that you explain to the examiner that you understand what this force is all about, and then you can apply it to your example. Where people go wrong is that they tend to rush straight into the example without explaining the theory. Remember, the exam answer that you're giving is your essential job interview. The examiner doesn't know what you know unless you put it down on that page. We can't read into it. So you have to put your best foot forward. Okay, so in terms of new entrants for McDonald's then, it's not especially a difficult market to enter, but McDonald's do have some barriers of entry to help. They're global and have franchisees across the world, so they get the economies of scale, like uber economies of scale that other organisations wouldn't get. So if I just set up Laura's chicken joint, hopefully no one's trademarked that, um, then I'm not going to get the sort of economies of scale that McDonald's will get because I'm only buying for one. They have partnerships with larger organisations like Coca-Cola. They're the, as far as I'm aware, the only fast food outlet to sell Coca-Cola as opposed to Pepsi. They're extremely accessible. They've got lots of prime locations on high streets and drive throughs and so on. There's loyalty of customers. People are loyal to McDonald's, especially things like the Monopoly games creates that extra loyalty. And they're well established as a brand and been trading for generations. So all of this acts as a barrier to entry for them. However, as the market as a whole, it's not difficult to set up. Then we move on to the next force, threat of substitutes. 
This means the availability of alternatives in terms of products or service. Can your customers go elsewhere? And this all depends on customer loyalty, switching costs, perception of quality and so on. Do they perceive your goods to be better quality than others? Depending on the type of product you're offering, there may be different levels of loyalty from customers. And if the market is saturated with different substitutes, this dictates the price and makes it more price sensitive, which means that you're gonna to have to lower your prices. So that's the explanation of what the threat of substitutes is all about. Then let's apply it to our example. So for McDonald's, there's lots of substitutes in the market, though very few as large as McDonald's. And the way that McDonald's kind of deal with the threat of substitutions is that they have different ranges, targeting different customers from say kids with the Happy Meals to the luxury burgers, to the McCafes with the coffee and so on. So they are trying to appeal to all kind of demographics. There are no switching costs per se, although I do think that in the UK at least, when you go to Burger King, it does seem to be a lot more expensive than McDonald's. Don't quote me on that, but that's just my impression. However, there is a kind of customer loyalty to the range of offerings that McDonald's has, whether it's a Cadbury's McFlurry or whether it's a chicken nugget or something along those lines, people want and will be loyal to that particular thing. And the market is quite price sensitive, but McDonald's have responded to this with a range of different prices. So they've got the value meals versus the kind of luxury signature burgers and so on. So they're trying to kind of caveat that substitution. So that's threat of substitutes. Supplier power. Supplier power is generally exercised to raise prices and squeeze a buyer's profits down. Suppliers have power when they are limited in number. So there's very few of them, or they're a very large size and there's a lack of substitute products. So the buyer can't go elsewhere. In terms of McDonald's supplier power, McDonald's have a lot of control over their supply side for a number of reasons. Firstly, due to their size and reputation as an established brand that's been a market leader. So obviously it's a huge account for a supplier to have to supply McDonald's usually. Secondly, they have some close long-term partnerships, you know, like the likes of Coca-Cola and so on. And in America, I believe they've done backward vertical integration where they've actually taken over the cattle farms to control the quality of their meat. There are lots of suppliers in the market for the majority of what McDonald's are buying and quite a few large buyers who have large shares of the market. So that weakens the level of supply power. Although there will be some like Coca-Cola. I think there was an issue with Heinz ketchup. So now they just have red sauce. They don't use Heinz anymore. Um, all of these things. So some suppliers may have a lot of power, but they're few and far between for McDonald's. Let's talk buyer power then. They, and we're talking about buyers as in consumers, customers, make an industry more competitive by enabling buyers to force down prices or bargain for higher quality or improved services. So buyers are powerful when they're limited in number and their spend is a high proportion of the supplier's revenue and where there are substitute products. So if we apply this, and I really am gonna focus not as the buyer for McDonald's, but as the customer, what power do consumers have? Well, customers actually do have more power than you might think. There are multiple substitute options on the market and the level of power has been shown by how McDonald's have amended their services to meet customer demand. So to give you an example, putting the calorie count on products before they legally had to, free fruit for children, reduced salt content, offering the salads, which I believe were worse in some cases than some of the burgers in terms of calories. Deli sandwiches to try and compete with Subway, the coffees, the McCafes that open in big cities, the vegetarian, the fully 100% vegetarian McDonald's in India that's opened up and so on. So they do listen to their consumers. Individually, consumers can only have a small amount of spend unless you are going to McDonald's like that documentary did, you know, the Super Size Me documentary where he went every single day for, was it a month or two months? Morgan Spurlock or something like that. Um, unless you're doing that, then you're gonna have a small spend. But on mass, customers can have quite a lot of buyer power with McDonald's because they talk with their feet. And the final force is competitive rivalry. This is all about the intensity of the market in terms of competition, in terms of innovation, price wars, any kind of promotional battles and so on. 
So remember, we're in the fast food market. This is incredibly competitive and intense. So as I said, McDonald's are in a very intense market with a huge amount of new product development, price wars, promotional battles, and so on. However, McDonald's have a large hold on the market and tend to win the promotional battles because they've got things like the new Happy Meal toys from the newest movies and so on. And they've responded to innovation and competition from the likes of Subway, their largest rival, arguably, and Starbucks by adding similar products to their ranges, which in most cases can be a lower price than Subway or Starbucks. So they are attempting to compete on lots of different areas, shall we say. So we've gone through all of the forces now, and I think it is important that if you don't do it per force, which you absolutely could and should, you can also create an overall conclusion at the end. So this is my conclusion. You can agree or disagree with it. This is what I've put down. They're in a strong position, despite heavy competition in their market. However, Subway did surpass them as a market leader a few years back. So McDonald's do still need to keep on the ball. They need to invest in new products, new ways of marketing to ensure that they hold on to that market share and increase it. And this process is going to be something that's ongoing. McDonald's have to continuously monitor the market. So Porter's Five Forces can't be just a one and done. It's, it's just a snapshot. They'll need to constantly do that analysis, market analysis, customer analysis, competitor analysis, and so on to ensure that they stay ahead of the curve. So that brings me to the end of this question. Hope you found this useful. Thank you so much for listening and I'll catch you back for another constructive response exam question soon. Bye for now.